All right, so now let's kind of talk uh, about determining the inverse when we're given some restrictions on the domain. So this is going to be now part of our um, discussion when we talked about the restricted domain. So what you can see here is we have a function f of x equals 3x squared minus 2. Now, in and of itself, that quadratic function here is unrestricted on the domain. There are no implied restrictions. So the implied domain would be from negative infinity to infinity. However, there is a restriction on this domain for values of x have to be greater than or equal to zero. So I will show the um, Desmos of this one. Okay, so we'll come back to that. I will bring the, uh, let me see here. I'm gonna open that up. Yeah, okay. I will bring the Desmos uh, back up on that one. So we can take a look at it. But I think we kind of actually already know a little bit of information on this anyways, 3x squared minus 2. So if we were to kind of graph that, uh, minus 2 is going to be down here. And then 3x is just going to be a vertical stretch. So anyways, the graph is going to you know, look something like this. It'll probably be a little bit more vertically stretched. But if I'm looking at adding this restriction, instead of graphing the whole quadratic, I'm only going to graph the quadratic for the x values that are greater than 0. So only for values are greater than 0 over here. So I can basically just erase that portion. So that's what the restriction, restricted domain allows us to do. Now this is important because what this tells us is we're only worrying about the positive um, values of that function. So if we were to look into the graph of this, if I just wanted to kind of sketch this, I know the graph here is going to you know look, uh, or should probably be like that. The graph is going to look something like that as far as the inverse graph. But let's go on algebraically, um, go and figure out what the inverse graph looks like, and then you know we can kind of compare our answers here. So again, following like really the same process that we've done before. Here we're going to swap this for our y, and then we're going to swap the variables. So we have x equals 3y squared minus 2. Okay. Um, and now to solve for y, I need to use my inverse operation, so I'll add a 2. Actually, let's zoom in here. So I'll add a 2 on both sides. So therefore, I have x plus 2 equals 3y squared. Divide by 3. Divide by 3 on both sides. Um, again, I prefer to write, instead of dividing by 3, I prefer to write this as a 1 third in front. So therefore, I can rewrite this as a 1 third times x plus 2. Now, you could distribute that 3 into both of them, but I'm going to show you and explain why that is not a preferred method in this case. So here we have y squared. Now, again, to get rid of the squaring, we're now going to need to take the square root of both sides. And this is where it becomes important. This is where it's different than the cubic root, because the square root is a restriction, right? It has that implied restriction. We can't take the square root of a negative value, right? So. Um, but in this case, since our original function was, since this, oh, well, and again, hold on, let me get to that point. You can't take the negative root, right? So that's one part of our restriction. But then the other thing is when you introduce the square root, you have to include the plus or the minus, right? And what that makes us happen or what that allows us to do is now we have two solutions. Now when we solve for y, which is really going to be our f inverse, so now when I say, you know, f inverse of x, I have plus or minus the square root of one third x plus two. And but fortunately for us, we that's not going to produce a function, right? Because you're going to have for every x value, you have two y values. So that definition of function doesn't work. But since we have this restriction where my x values are going to remain positive, I'm only going to include the positive root. Now, I don't need to write plus square root. I can just delete both of those. But we just know now we're only going to inquire about the positive root of, um, of our inverse function. Now, the next thing, the reason why I'm keeping this as one third times x plus two is because this tells us what our transformations are. If you remember our previous unit of transformations, um, this is in the form of b times x minus c, right? So this plus two is telling me to shift the graph two units to the left, right? And this one third, what that's telling me is that's going to be a, um, the one third is telling me that's going to be a, uh, uh, let's see, that is going to be a vertical um, stretch, or I'm sorry, horizontal uh, compression of that form, too. No. Yes, I'm like mixing up my things. Uh, let's go and take a look at their graphs, and my thing will come back up to me. Oh, no, why do you do that to me? All right, I don't know why that happened, so let me just go and fix this. 
All right, so I'll bring it back up, and here, let's go in and look at example number four. Oh, so there's exactly what the example looks like. And then let's go and see what the inverse function, so that's f of x equals the square root of 1 divided by 3. And then that was times um, x, I forgot what the x minus 2. So x minus 2. Oops, that's plus 2, I'm sorry. The inverse was x plus 2. And therefore, you can see that, yes, that is the inverse function. That is now reflective about the equation y equals x, right? So you can see how those uh, now work. So that's very, very important. It's our horizontal stretch, yeah, because it's the same thing as vertical regression. So it's a horizontal, um, that one third, yeah, it's a horizontal stretch. Um, so there you go. There you can see how that works by restricting that domain because if I didn't have that domain restriction, I wouldn't have a function. I would have a sideways uh, parabola. All right, so let's go and look at the next example here, and then we'll go back to Desmos to kind of verify our result. So in this example, we have another function, or we have another quadratic. This one is in vertex form, all right? Um, and we have a restriction now for x values that are less than or equal to negative 2. And again, we have enough information right now to kind of graph the quadratic with the restriction without the restriction. So let's just go and graph it, and then we can verify in Desmos. So this is being uh, shifted two units to the left and one unit up. And a is 1, positive 1, so it's going to be a nice little quadratic here. It's going to look something like that. Right, But again, my restrictions on this, my restricted domain here is only values that are less than negative 2. So therefore, I can just simply delete that portion. I'm only going to be finding the inverse of the for values of x that are less than negative 2. All right, so now let's mathematically go ahead and find the inverse. So we'll replace this with y, swap the variables. So x equals y plus 2 squared plus 1. Now what we want to do is, again, go ahead and solve for y. So I'll subtract a 1 on both sides. So I get x minus 1 equals y plus 2 squared. And now, jeez, oh come on. Now I'll take the uh, square root of both sides. So we'll root both sides. Now again, when you introduce the square root, you have that plus or minus, right? Um, so therefore, I have you know, y plus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of x minus 1. But again, we don't want to be dealing with the plus or minus because that's not going to produce a function. So we've got to determine, is it going to be the positive or is this going to be the negative? And you can see that our restriction is going to be, you know, to the left, the more negative values of that vertex. So therefore, we're going to want to include, in this case, the negative root. And we'll see why that's going to work or why that's going to help us justify here via Desmos. And then we'll subtract 2 on both sides, and we get a final uh, fun inverse function of f negative, negative x of negative square root of x minus 1 minus 2. So if we were to graph that, I don't know what happened here. So that's left 2. So if we were to graph this, all right, so this is a radical function that has been reflected about the x-axis. It's being shifted one unit to the right and down 2. So it's 1. Two. And then you can see that it is reflected. So if it was not reflected, it would look like that. But it's not reflected about the x-axis. It's going to look something like that, right? So let's go into uh, Desmos. I guess I'll just go to the same browser here. And just to confirm our result, there you go. And then if I go ahead and click on a new one, so f of x equals, let's say, negative square root of x minus 1 minus 2. And then let's plug in the y equals x line. And you can see that they are symmetrical, right? So I did my work um, you know, correct. But it's very important to understand how those restrictions, when they are provided to us, are going to play a part in uh, writing the domain I'm sorry, not even writing the domain, but understanding uh, the function as well as understanding the uh, 
uh, the function and its restriction. Now, it's also important, we are restricting the domain here, right? So if we're restricting the domain, guess what that tells us? That automatically tells us the range of our inverse function, right? I don't even need to think about this. If I know the domain of this purple graph is greater than zero, well, that means the range of my function is going to be for y values that are greater than zero. Think about this one x values are less than negative 2. So that means the range of my uh, inverse function is going to be y is less than negative 2. And there you go. Look at that. Um, and then you can just look at the graph to go ahead and determine domain. Or you could go back and look at this as far as um, you know the range here we know is going to be from 1 to infinity. So therefore, the domain here is going to be from 1 to infinity. And again, that works because the domain that's the domain restriction on this radical. So Sometimes we're going to be dealing with functions like in the previous example three where there are going to be no restrictions and you know you can just you'll be fine when you find the inverse. However, sometimes we're going to be dealing with functions that were provided a restriction that we have to take into account. And in the next example, what we're going to do is we are now going to be finding the inverse and we're going to be applying restrictions that are going to make sure that our function is now going to be a um, that our function is now going to, our inverse is now going to be a function.